Hey everyone, this is Aaron Ellis with the Crypto Manual. So how do you get involved in cryptocurrencies? In this video, I share with you how to effectively invest in cryptocurrencies, taking lessons from billionaire venture capitalist, Tim Draper. Tim is a billionaire venture capitalist from Silicon Valley in California. In March of 2018, he joined the Switzerland Crypto Summit to share with crypto enthusiasts how to build their crypto portfolios and how to be mindful investors without getting overwhelmed in the process. He later shares how crypto is changing our economy and our world in a way that is bigger than the internet boom. Tim was an early investor in Bitcoin and believes it is transformative in how it is changing our economy and our world. Listen in as Tim shares with you how to be an investor in crypto, grow your portfolios, and how to hold more of it. I'll be back later to share with you how we can help you build more crypto without having to buy more Bitcoin to grow more of it. Now from the Crypto Summit in Zurich on March 28th, 2018. He's been listed among the most outstanding Harvard alumni. He's among the top 10 on the Forbes Meet Us list and as one of the 100 most powerful people in finance. Tim Draper. You're one of the few venture capitalists which has gone for a blockchain uh, technology and, and, and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies for, at a very early time. Um, and you've, you've stuck with it. You've said, I think, at some point, you know, why should I sell, uh, why should I sell any cryptocurrencies? It's like I'd be trading the, the future for the past. And that sounds like a terrible idea. I think investors, especially those who are, who are maybe not yet quite as long in the space as you might be interested in, what's your advice? And, and you know, what are, what are some of the lessons learned for uh, crypto investing that you could share with us? Wow, this is really interesting because I think Switzerland is starting to recognize something that I've been focused on a long time, which is regulatory competition. Um, if, if you have heavy regulations, you lose your business. Uh, Switzerland, it's fun talking to Switzerland. You had the tiger by the tail. Um, everyone was going to do their ICOs through you. And all you had to do is make it easier for everybody. And, uh, and instead, uh, uh, the regulatory bodies got in there and they, they made it tougher. They kept putting more and more barriers up. And, uh, and so people went to Singapore and to uh, Gibraltar and to Cayman and to other places because, uh, because it got too regulatorily hev heavy. And I do feel like um, governments now have to compete for us. We can move. We can go from country to country. I mean, there's still some sort of weird patriotic loyalty to countries. But, but I think people are starting to recognize that they can move. And, uh, and we can Skype anywhere. And we can uh, handle uh, the communication systems anywhere. And, uh, and so we can choose, we can pick and choose the government that's, that's right for us. And Switzerland had a, an enormous opportunity there. And I think that they've lost their big opportunity, but maybe they can bring it back by, um, by being regulatory light. Um, it's really interesting. It's great to see all you investors out there. Um, somebody asked, where should I? domicile my ICO. Um, yeah, I think it's Liechtenstein in Europe, but it's Gibraltar everywhere else, um, maybe Singapore. Um, the Swiss had a really interesting structure, but, um, but we, we had real trouble with it because um, they set it up so that there were two th things. There was a nonprofit and a for-profit, and the nonprofit was supposed to raise all the money and, uh, and own most of the tokens, and they would feed the money and the tokens into the nonprofit. And the for-profit and nonprofit had to be run by two different people. And uh, with Tezos, we, we ran into real problems with that structure. Uh, fortunately, uh, we've got some uh, rational people working on it now. And, uh, and we think Tezos is gonna be one of the great uh, tokens of, of our time. But, um, but beware of people's incentives. Beware uh, that uh, if you're a regulator, beware that people can move. And that if you're too heavy handed, 
you're going to lose your um, you're going to lose all your customers, all your constituents, uh, and and if you're an ICO uh, uh, issuer, then I I highly recommend that you go uh, uh, to the place that's the easiest for you. And if now if you're an investor, here's here's what was the shocker to me. I when I first saw. Um, an ICO. Fortunately, um, I asked a lot of very tough questions and pointed questions to figure out exactly where all the money goes and where all the tokens go. It turns out when you uh, invest in a company that is doing an ICO, um, there are three pies. You know, it used to be there was just one pie. There was the equity pie and it, the equity pie would be divided according to, you know, you put in some money and there's an equity pie. Well, with tokens, there are now three pies. And the first pie is, uh, is the equity pie because there is still a for-profit organization there. And that could end up being where the entrepreneurs move all their efforts. And so that's just the, that's the old way of doing venture capital. And then there's a pie that's the uh, that's the token pie. How are the tokens split up? And if for some reason the founders are treated differently than the company is in the in the token pie, uh, you've got to ask some serious questions. Uh, I I don't think it's appropriate for a founder to to sell you 10% of your biz, their business, and then you, and then the founder gets, say, 10% of their uh, of these tokens separately from the company, uh, because then you're not participating in the company. And then the third thing is the cash. A bunch of cash comes out uh, when people buy tokens. And where does that cash go? And what's it going to be used for? Those are all really good questions. And when I say cash, I mean fiat cash. Uh, or, or sometimes it comes in the form of Bitcoin or, um, or other crypto. But it's, it's much more readily exchangeable than, uh, than the token that they're issuing. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of my advice to um, to investors who want to participate in the token economy. And my other advice is do it. Um, this is this is one of the greatest moments in the history of the world that we've ever had. Um, there was the. Iron Age and the Bronze Age and the Industrial Age and the Internet Age. There is the the Bitcoin blockchain crypto age, and this age is is bigger than any of the other ages because it's global and it's decentralized and it completely transforms the world. And let me get into that. There are um, there are a lot of ways you can uh, you can think about. Uh, making change. Uh, what we've noticed is that we've made the most money and, the, and created the biggest and most exciting companies when, uh, when we found an entrepreneur that was using a new technology to enter a, uh, a very large industry, and that industry was run by a, a monopolist or oligopolist uh, who were providing bad service at a high cost to the customers. And, uh, and, and that happened, uh, the internet came along and that happened in many, many industries, in communications with Skype and information with Google, with um, Napster changed the music industry, but, but you know, eventually it was iTunes and Spotify. Um, uh, all of these industries got changed. They were all run by monopolists and oligopolists. And, uh, and when people came in with the internet, that new, that new technology, all of a sudden, 
um, you had an opportunity. You ha you saw entrepreneurs with an opportunity to to build a wedge into that marketplace and then expand into that marketplace. And uh, Skype did that beautifully. They they uh, cut into the long distance carrier business and uh, and they grew and they became the long the biggest long distance carrier in the world. Um, so. That's what I look for in a startup. I look for a company that is uh, taking a new technology and applying it to an industry that could potentially change that is currently run by a monopolist or an oligopoly and providing bad service at a high cost. Uh, <clears throat> and the blockchain came along. Well, first, first I gotta talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin came along and there was um, a major breakthrough in currency. And all of a sudden there was something decentralized that I could take from country to country without any uh, decrement in my value. And I could spend it in any country. Um, it was an easy money to send across borders. It was, um, it was uh, money that, uh, not subject to the political whims of some country or another. And I started to think that this was uh, having a real global currency was something that was going to really change society. And um, you can read my book to figure out how I actually came upon it all. Uh, it's called The Startup Hero. Um, and, uh, but now, uh, that blockchain is the perfect ledger. And you can take a perfect ledger and do a lot more interesting things with it. Um, it, it a, a perfect ledger can mean that all your healthcare can be on one, on one blockchain and you can keep track of all your health records, all your Fitbit results, everything you've eaten, all the um, excursions you've had, all the travel you've done, your blood tests, your blood, your ancestry, you can put it all on one, in one place on, ans uh, on uh, the blockchain. And, at the, and, and as we all do that, we are going to have amazing information. And that information will be incredibly valuable for healthcare. And people will be able to do deep learning with all that big data. And, um, and a doctor will become more of a consultant because they'll, what they will do is refer to the cloud and then interpret it. And, uh, and so, you know, 12 years of memorization might go away. It might be more like, um, you know, more like uh, handling things human, humanly and interpreting. Uh, so healthcare is gonna change in a big way. Drug companies just pushing some drug that worked on 40% of the population on everybody, uh, that's going to go away uh, because you know that a drug on me and a drug on you might have entirely different effects. Uh, but they're just happy to just pound those pills out and, and force us in some way or another to take them. Um, <coughs> healthcare is a big one. Banking and investment banking and venture capital are all getting changed as we speak. Um, there's the, the old way of having monopolistic, oligopolistic banks, uh, that's gone. If anybody who's ever used a ledger to buy crypto recognizes that you've got this ledger, it's like a USB thing, and you look at it and you go, oh my gosh, I don't need that bank. I don't need to support all those people in that big, huge, beautiful building that is a bank. Now, this is really tough news for you in Switzerland because I know Swiss banks are a big deal. But I think there's an opportunity for Switzerland to reclaim the high land here and jump in front of this crypto world and appreciate it and accept Bitcoin and become, you know, like Japan, say, hey, Bitcoin's a, a local currency here and, and it's a recognized currency. Um, <laughs> But I, I want to get into the final part here, which is government. Um, the government is the 
the industry that provides the worst service at the highest cost and always run by monopolies. And all of a sudden, there's this whole part of government that's virtual, this whole layer that's virtual. There's the, there's the terrestrial part, and that probably won't change too, too much, too radically with this um, new world. But there's the, uh, although they're going to have to compete for us because we'll move to another piece of territory if we don't like what the government's doing. Um, and we'll rally in social media if we don't like the, what the government's doing. Anyway, there's this this uh, virtual layer of government, and and in Estonia they've already done it. Uh, they've already started to reach outside their borders and say, "Hey, we can provide services to people outside our borders. They don't have to be here." And uh, and that has actually made it so uh, so we can start thinking about virtual governance as a competitive force. And if we've got virtual government as a competitive force, all these things that government does that are insurance policies in effect, uh, healthcare insurance, welfare, pensions, uh, uh, redistribution of income, uh, managing your managing taxes and, and, uh, and government programs, the, they are all uh, now subject to being a part of the blockchain. And this could end up being a, a remarkable time where amazing um, evolutions and revolutions happen and you guys get to be a part of it and as investors, jump in, hold on, this is going to be amazing, an amazing wild ride. Um, and with that, I think I'm out of time. Uh, but I'd, I'd be open to a few questions if uh, the technology will allow it. All right, Tim, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you well. Excellent. Um, so we, we don't have too much time, but I do want to give a time for, for a question. Who would like to ask a, Tim a question? Hands up now. Yep, I see you. You went up right straight there. Mike is coming. Just hold on, because otherwise Tim will not be able to hear you. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, behind there? Yes. Just a little bit of patience. It's a big room with a big crowd. Hi, Robert Levin of Emerging Star Capital. Uh, Tim, it's t terrific what you've done in your career. You have deep insight into innovation and the role of government. My question is what, is, what kind of platforms do you envision five, ten years from now for, let's say, decentralized policy solutions being promoted by smart groups like Stanford University or Draper University? So more policy entrepreneurship financed by crowdfunding on the blockchain or future dis distributed ledger technologies. If you can give us, A, your vision, two, the techniques. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't hear two, Robert. Um, your not only vision, but the techniques of launching, let's say, policy-oriented solutions on the blockchain that are decentralized and then implemented locally but financed regionally, for example. Yeah. Um, great question. This is a really exciting time for this. We, um, the way I'm looking at it, um, my vision is not one where I'm setting any kind of a policy or, or trying to create uh, some form of government or another. My vision is that governments, like industry, are now going to be in a position where they have to compete for their constituents, first at the terrestrial level and then at the virtual level. And when there's that competition, uh, great things happen and they do great things for their constituencies. When you have a monopoly, they get overbearing. Uh, they, they charge a high cost for bad service, and that's what's been going on all across the world. Every government everywhere around the world is charging too much for bad service. And, uh, and now there is this, this new way of governing, at least the virtual part of governing, that can be a competitive field. And I think that's what's really gonna be the key. You can actually, and, and 
a lot of these ICOs are coming out with lots of interesting new ways of, of thinking about how they govern their their constituents. Um, uh, I guess it started, well, started with Bitcoin. Bitcoin was um, a proof of work uh, system. And then Tezos said, no, you want to do a pr proof of stake. And, uh, and then now there's proof of work, proof of stake. Now there's uh, proof of... Uh, identity. Uh, there, there are going to be many, many, many different types of governances that I, I believe that will come because of the creativity of the people and the fact that suddenly there is a competitive field here. And so I think that's what's really going to be um, a really dynamic field. We, we are looking to invest very heavily in anything blockchain and government and anything uh, blockchain and healthcare. Um, now we'll look at anything. We're looking at vertical takeoff and landing. We'll look at it, anything. But, um, but these are two very hot buttons for me because I think that they're enormous industries that really need uh, changing and we got a bigger opportunity to do it. Is there a question, I'd, I'd like it if you guys, um, if you could point to a girl or a woman, um, to uh, ask a question because they all, it's always fun to, sometimes they, they aren't bold enough. So come on, go be bold and be empowered all right. women. Second round. Uh, Tim, uh, sure. Adriana here. Uh, I'm from uh, Master Ventures. My question to you is more from the beginning when you're talking about ecosystems and how, how, come, how the loss from a city can, can bring or take people from that ecosystem and to grow new ecosystem based on that. Can you like uh, elaborate a little more? Yeah, we've, um, we've built a very competitive ec ecosystem um, at Draper University and Hero City. Uh, we, we created a, a university that has attracted people from 72 different countries. And it's only five years old and we already have students um, donating scholarships back. Um, and, uh, and that creating an ecosystem that has that virtue, virtuous cycle is very important. Um, now the Silicon Valley has a, has a, a an enormous edge here in <laughs> ecosystems because they have, um, they have built this whole platform for change. They've, they've built a platform for innovation and change and, um, and everywhere you go in the Silicon Valley, people are saying, well, how can we improve on what these guys have done? How can we improve on what these guys have done? Um, and so you, you're always looking for, you know, some sort of new creative revolution coming from the Silicon Valley. A lot of other parts of the world are much more stagnant where they, they say um, things like, oh, let's be realistic. Whenever you hear, let's be realistic, always think um, this is somebody who doesn't want any kind of change. They, they like it just the way it is. Um, or or uh, say, saying the word impossible. You know, anything we can imagine is possible. Uh, it's, it's crazy, but I grew up watching Star Trek. And all of those things, just about all of those things, except that the except for the Starship Enterprise, have been done. We have the communicator. We have the tricorder reading. We have the the uh, the medical device that just sees you from outside your body. Um, if you can imagine it, it can happen. And so I always say, imagine. Um, something extraordinary and something great for the world and it will happen. Uh, so, uh, so I think ecosystems can be built anywhere in the world. Um, we have a big lead in the Silicon Valley, but um, all these other parts of the world uh, have a huge uh, opportunity now. And a little of that has to, quite a bit of that has to do with a supportive government and uh, and if they are supportive, people will go there. Um, and if they are not supportive, they will leave. China had Deng Xiaoping, and he he created freedom in China for 40 years. 
China grew like crazy in those 40 years. And now they've got a president who's making huge mistakes. He's blocking everything. He's controlling everything. And, and whenever you, you see governments control, uh, that, that brings poverty and eventually slavery. Uh, whenever you see governments uh, give freedom and open up, uh, that's when uh, that's when uh, the people become wealthy and and uh, prosperous. So so freedom equals wealth and prosperity. Control equals poverty and slavery. Um, people say, oh, but we need control. Well, that's those are people that say, I know better than you do what to do with your life, your money. Uh, whatever, and they are the ones who are keeping us down. Uh, so make sure that you're not one of those. Make sure what you're one of those people that says anything is possible, and let's be unreasonable. <laughs> Tim, we are definitely... <laughs> You're definitely not one of those because we live in Switzerland, the most decentralized and democratic country. Now let's listen to Tim as he shares on CNBC his involvement in Bitcoin and how crypto is revolutionizing the world. Then I'll be back to share how you can be a part of this movement to capitalize on crypto. You with your Bitcoin tie. Absolutely. <laughs> Promoting as I go. Yep. Um, you were an early investor in Bitcoin. You bought some of the Bitcoin assets that were auctioned off by the U.S. Marshals uh, with the shutdown of Silk Road. But you're also a big investor in the company. So tell me about how you take a look at the opportunities out there and how you view the ecosystem. Well, I think uh, crypto in general and Bitcoin specifically is transformative. Suddenly you have a distributed currency that is not subject to the whims of some political force or another. It can go across border. It's global. In fact, I think the word international is going to fade away and the new world glo word global is going to come forward. And and I think we've, we've got the beginning of a major movement. And I think it's bigger than the ice, the Iron Age and the Bronze Age and the Internet age. This is the biggest thing that's ever happened in the to the world today. I think we've got one of the great opportunities as investors. We've got a great opportunity to participate through Bitcoin, through other crypto, through uh, Coinbase, through other uh, all these groups that are doing incredible things. And as a human, mm -hmm. I think we've now got a world where there's there's going to be governance that's local, but then there's going to be this virtual governance that we're all going to be a part of. And all the various governments are going to be virtual and competing for us so that they'll have to provide good service at a, at a low cost. And that's something governments haven't had to do before. Right. So, Tim, you can have some massive hits. Web, web 1.0, Web yeah. 2.0, okay? How convicted, well, how, how is the similarity in conviction to blockchain technology and crypto assets relative to those past two periods for you? Okay, well, so Web 1.0 and 2.0 were, well, I guess 1.0 1 transformed communications and information and saw and gaming and entertainment and all those interesting uh, industries. They were all pretty big industries and they got transformed. Your industry, media, transformed in a big way by the internet. Well, now there are these industries that are even bigger and they're generally highly regulated. And those industries are the ones that are potentially transformed by the blockchain, real estate, insurance, uh, banking, uh, venture capital, investment banking, and, um, and healthcare. And government itself, I think, is, is an industry. Uh, a lot of people think of it as like a foregone conclusion, but it's an industry, and we're going to be able to choose the government that's right for us. And I think that's a whole new way of looking at the world. The world's going to open up, and, uh, and they're going to have to provide service just like every other business provides good service for their customers. So you mentioned a number of industries that could adopt the use of blockchain to sort of help them to save money, etc. In the long run, though, do these same industries, are they at risk of being displaced entirely? 
long term um, well, you know what happens? friend or foe. It, it's never like uh, one or a zero. It's right. not just like, hey, it's just going to all disappear and everything's going to go away, which is what the media was saying about itself for a while. And right. now the media is like thriving and We're things here. are going well. <laughs> Um, there is always like a, a, a reboot and a refreshing that happens when there's a new technology that comes through in a wave and it starts affecting different industries. And I've seen that so many times now that I'm sort of thinking, yeah, this is what's going to happen. And I'm so sure of it that I'll make stupid and stupid commitments like, hey, when Bitcoin was 300, say, in three years it's going to be 10,000. And people are looking at me like, huh. It's totally crazy. <laughs> and then it was like three years to the day. It was a weird, that was weird. That was weird. So, There's so something you, cool there. You've <laughs> seen, you, you mentioned multiple cycles, right? And di multiple tech cycles. Uh, as investors, we get excited about what the promise is here. But then when I talk to developers, they're telling me, you know what? We're not a 1995 internet, we're a 1980s internet. Where do you see it? Is there a disconnect between investors and the developers? Are you talking about real estate developers? No, no, I'm talking about oh. um, blockchain developers, right? You and I get all excited about oh, all these things that can happen. Started. Right. Oh, this is going to be enormous. And at Draper Associates, we're making investments in companies that that are just getting, this is just the, the early piece of the iceberg. We haven't even found the tip of the iceberg because there's so much more that can be done. Whenever there's this kind of a new technology, all this creativity is formed. If you're running one, one type of business and then you see that you could do an ICO and create a coin that then has a new marketplace, you say, oh, hey, I've got a new way of operating. And it makes both the coin and the business better because you get both, you get that extra creative boost from all of that. And it's really um, kind of, this is the most excited I've ever been as an investor, and I was right there at the beginning of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so make another prediction for us, Tim, because you correctly called Bitcoin 10,000 to the day, practically. What's your next call? Okay, so, so <laughs> I'm holding off on that because April 12th, we're having a big uh, party. And I'm going to make the announcement April there. April 12th. And you are 12th. all invited. All, right. all, all you. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, and I'm going to make an announcement then of what uh, what my prediction is. Um, one of my predictions is that in five years, you're going to walk in and try to pay fiat for a, for a Starbucks coffee. And, and they are in the barista is going to laugh at you because they're going to say, what is this? You know, are you counting out pennies or, you know, give, him, give me shells? So it's no going to more be like, US no dollars being they're used They're not going to cash. use fiat. Five years from now, none of us will because all the en engineering effort, all that excitement is focused really on Bitcoin and all of the, all of the uh, cryptos around it. And I think that's what we're all going to be using and paying with. Um, and then uh, we are doing at Draper University, we're doing a crypto um, boot camp, a Bitcoin boot camp. And that is, um, that's leading up to the party. And so it's all going to kind of come to that one moment, April 12th, wow. when I give you exactly what you're asking. Wow. All right. So let me ask you this one last question. A fresh dollar to put to work, yes, fiat for now, <laughs> but a yeah. fresh dollar to work, would you put it into an existing cryptocurrency or would you put it into an ICO? Um, a fresh dollar, I, here's the funny thing, here's <laughs> how I look at a okay. fresh dollar. You talked about volatility and everybody's saying, oh, Bitcoin's very volatile. I think Bitcoin's very stable. It's all these other currencies that are very volatile and they're falling away as Bitcoin becomes the standard for all of us to use. And so I think of a dollar and I think, well, let me get rid of it. <laughs> I want to move into something that is going to be used in so the So what future. would that be? Well, it would be Bitcoin. It would still be Bitcoin. Oh, Even absolutely. though all these other coins have come out, they've gained oh, like market cap back on Bitcoin. entrepreneurs that are doing something with Bitcoin mm -hmm. or, or some of these other currencies. Yeah, they're all very interesting because um, I think Bitcoin will be the standard. That'll be like the Microsoft when, when the internet came, be sort of the standard th or the Google. And then there will be all these others that could become uh, Amazon or Apple or, or uh, Facebook, but 
but some will also be just like um, small little boutiques. Right. Like they'll have like they're they'll only use a, a marketplace that's kind of a, a just for rings or just uh -huh. for uh, for people who are green. Right. Right. Or people who are or women. I th I keep looking for the women coin. <laughs> I think that's going to be huge because it's find this it, movement. Let me know. <laughs> it's this huge movement. Let me know, Tim. And, and the coins have this ability to right. do a movement, to like okay. monetize a movement. Right. It's different yeah. from a corporation. It's different sure. from a nonprofit. It's something new. Right. And it's it's like the prediction of something that's going to happen that you right. want to happen. It's like Kickstarter for societal change. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Tim, great to speak with you. Thanks. Great. For your time. So, if you want to learn how to build your crypto portfolio and generate more crypto to hold more of it before we enter into a huge bull run, click the link below this video and learn how to use our system and tools to capitalize on crypto before you miss the boat. I can't wait to share with you how to join this movement. Go to thecryptomanual.com now and be sure to subscribe to our channel and click that bell for more updates, news, and insights on capitalizing on crypto.